In the late 1980s, Toronto tried to do something no one else had ever done. Build a stadium that could control the sky. It cost half a billion dollars, pushed the limits of engineering and changed how the world saw Canada. This wasn't just about baseball, it was about identity, ambition and the moment Toronto dared to think bigger than anyone thought it could. This is the story of the Sky Dome. The idea of building a dome stadium can be tracked back to the bid that Toronto lost to Montreal as the Canadian candidate city for the 1976 Summer Olympics. In Toronto's proposal, an 80,000 to 100,000 seat complex would be part of the planned Harbour City development on the site of Maple Leaf Stadium. However, with the selection of Montreal, the project was abandoned. But another event a few years later would become the real push to build an enclosed stadium. In November 1982, the hometown Toronto Argonauts were making their first Grey Cup appearance since 1971. The game was played in a driving rainstorm at Exhibition Stadium that left most of the crowd drenched. As many of the seats were completely exposed to the elements, thousands watched the game from the concession section. In the media, the stadium was called the Rain Bowl. Among those watching was Ontario Premier Bill Davis. On live national television, the misery of that day played out before 7.8 million Canadians the largest audience in the country's history up to that point. The following day, at a rally for the Argos at Toronto City Hall, tens of thousands of people who attended the game began to chant, WE WANT A DOME! WE WANT A DOME! Seven months later, in June 1983, Davis formally announced a three-person committee would look into the feasibility of building a domed stadium, initially at Exhibition Place. The committee consisted of Paul Godfrey, Larry Grossman, and former Ontario Hydro Chairman, Hugh McCauley. After two years of studies and evaluation, in 1985, the committee decided to launch an international competition to design a new stadium and select a site. Some of the proposed sites included Exhibition Place, Downsview Airport, and York University. But the final site was at the base of the CN Tower, not far from Union Station, the city's most important railway and transit hub. The new stadium would be built on the Canadian National Railway lands, a major rail switching yard, encompassing the CNR Spadina Roundhouse. The chosen design, created by architect Rod Robbie and engineer Michael Allen, promised something the world had never seen, a fully retractable motorized roof. Construction was led by Ellie's Dawn Construction Company of London, Ontario and the Dominion Bridge Company of Lachine, Quebec and lasted about two and a half years from October 1986 to May 1989. The stadium was funded by a public-private partnership with the government paying the largest percentage of the cost. The initial cost of $150 million was greatly underestimated as the final cost was about $570 million, or $1.2 billion in 2025. Two levels of government, Metro Toronto and Provincial, each initially contributed $30 million. This does not include the value of the land that the stadium sits on, which was owned by the Canada Lands Company, a crown corporation of Canada. The area was leased to the City of Toronto for $900,000 a year through 2088. Canada's three main breweries, Labatt, Molson, and Carling O'Keefe, and the Toronto Blue Jays each paid $5 million to help fund the stadium. An additional 26 other corporations, selected by invitation only, also contributed $5 million each, for which they received one of the 161 skyboxes, a more luxurious space to watch the events, with four parking spaces, for 10 years with an opportunity for renewal and a 99-year exclusive option on stadium advertising. This unusual financial structure created controversy. First of all, there was no public tender for supplies and equipment. Secondly, companies that paid the 5 million fee, such as Coca-Cola, TSN and CIBC, received 100% stadium exclusivity, including advertising rights, 
for the life of their contract that could be extended up to 99 years. Third, the contracts were not put up for bid, meaning there was some doubt the contracts were made at a market rate. The construction of the stadium faced several challenges. The lands housed a functioning water pumping station that needed to be relocated, the soil was contaminated from a century of industrial use, railway buildings needed to be torn down or moved, and the site was rich with archaeological finds. Construction at the site unearthed over 1,500 artifacts. These included a 200-year-old French cannon used as a ballast for a ship, pottery, and a telescope. Moving the John Street pumping station across the street to the south of the stadium was also complex. Foundations to the stadium were being poured even as the facility in the infield area continued to function, as construction on its new location had yet to be completed. Because the stadium was the first of its kind in the world, the architects and engineers kept the design simple, by using a sturdy dome shape and used proven technologies to move the roof. It was important the design would work and be reliable, as to avoid the various problems that plagued Montreal's Olympic Stadium. The 31-story high roof consists of four panels. One, on the north end, is fixed in place and the other three are moved by electrically driven train engines that run on high-strength rails. The roof, which takes about 20 minutes to open, was made out of steel trusses covered by corrugated steel cladding which in turn is covered by a single-ply PVC membrane. Given its location south of the major railway corridor, new pedestrian connections had to be built. The infrastructure was part of the reason for the high cost of the stadium. The Skywalk, a 500-meter or 1,600 feet enclosed walkway, connects the base of the CN Tower to Union Station, and it's part of the PATH network. The John Street Cable State Bridge was built to provide north-south passage over the rail tracks, linking Front Street with the stadium. The official name prior and during construction was the Ontario Stadium Project, but was widely referred to in the local media as simply the Dome or Toronto Domed Stadium. As completion neared, the name Sky Dome was chosen as part of a province-wide Name the Stadium contest in 1987. Sponsored by the Toronto Sun, ballots were offered for people to submit their suggested names, with lifetime seats behind home plate to all events at the stadium, including concerts, as the prize. Over 150,000 entries were received, with 12,878 different names. The selection committee narrowed it down to four choices, Tower Dome, Harbour Dome, Sky Dome, and simply the Dome. The judges' final selection was Sky Dome. Premier David Peterson drew the prize-winning entry of Kelly Watson from a lottery barrel containing the over 2,000 entries that proposed Sky Dome. However, many didn't like the selection, including fans, the media, and even Blue Jays players. Veteran Willie Upshaw, centerfield Lloyd Mosby, and pitcher Dave Steeb all criticized the name choice, jokingly suggesting a ban for life for the Name the Dome contest winner. Kelly Watson received lifetime seating of choice at Sky Dome, which is still honored after the stadium was renamed to Rogers Center. The stadium was completed two months late, having been planned to open for the first regular season game of the 1989 Toronto Blue Jays season. But on June 3, 1989, the stadium finally opened, hosting an official grand opening show, the opening of the Sky Dome, a celebration. Broadcast on CBC Television the following evening, hosted by Brian Williams. With a crowd of over 50,000 in attendance, the event included appearances by Alan Thicke, Oscar Peterson, Andrea Martin, Impressionist André Philippe Gagnon, and rock band Glass Tiger. The roof was ceremonially opened by Ontario Premier David Peterson with a laser pan. The roof's opening exposed the crowd to a downpour of rain. Despite audible chants of close the roof, the roof remained fully open. For a few glorious years, the Sky Dome was not just a stadium, it was Toronto's living room. It hosted baseball and football games, rock concerts, wrestling matches and political spectacles. The building was a technological marvel and it became the stage for some of the most memorable moments in the city's modern history. 
The Toronto Blue Jays played their first game there on June 5th, 1989, defeating the Milwaukee Brewers 5-3 before a sold-out crowd. Just four years later, in 1993, the Sky Dome would witness one of the most iconic moments in baseball history. The Argos also called the Sky Dome home, and for a time, the stadium hosted the Canadian Football League's Grey Cup, including the 1989 and 1992 finals. Concerts also marked the dome. Within months of opening, the Sky Dome attracted global stars. Paul McCartney, U2, the Rolling Stones, and Madonna all performed beneath its massive roof. In 1990, WrestleMania VI brought over 67,000 fans, the largest indoor gathering in Canadian history at the time. And in 2002, WrestleMania 18, with the legendary fight between The Rock and Hulk Hogan, broke that record again. The Sky Dome Hotel, with its rooms overlooking the field, became a pop culture phenomenon, an occasional tabloid headline, for its unfiltered views during games. The Dome even hosted events that transcended entertainment, like part of a massive charity concert event for SARS relief in 2003. The Sky Dome was a beacon of progress, optimism and self-belief, but that dream came with a price. The stadium became a thorn in the side of David Peterson's Ontario Liberal government for repeated cost overruns. After the Liberals were defeated by the NDP in the 1990 Ontario election, a review by the new Bob Ray government in October 1990 revealed Statco's debt meant the Dome would have to be booked 600 days a year to turn a profit. The stadium income was only $17 million in its first year of operations, while that service was over $40 million. It was determined the late abrupt inclusion by Statco of a hotel and a health club added an additional $112 million to the cost of the building. As the province slipped into a recession, Ray appointed University of Toronto professor Bruce Kidd and Canadian Auto Workers President Bob White to the Statco board to help deal with the stadium growing debt. But the original $160 million debt had increased to $400 million by 1993. Statco became a political liability, and in March 1994, the Ontario government paid off all outstanding Statco debts from the government treasury and sold the stadium for $151 million. The stadium was bought by a private consortium that included Blue Jays owners, Labatt Breweries. This was the first in a series of ownership changes over the following years. In November 1998, the stadium, which Labatt then owned 49% of, filed for bankruptcy protection. That same month, the Blue Jays re-signed for an additional 10 years in the facility. In April 1999, Sportsco International LP bought the stadium out of bankruptcy protection for $80 million. Five years later, in November 2004, Rogers Communications, parent company of the Blue Jays, acquired the Sky Dome, excluding the attached Sky Dome Hotel, from Sportsco for about $25 million roughly 4% of the total cost of construction. On February 2, 2005, Ted Rogers, president and CEO of Rogers, announced a three-year corporate contract to change the name of the Sky Dome to Rogers Center. The name change remains controversial and is unpopular with many fans, most of whom continue to refer to it as Sky Dome. After the purchase, Rogers refurbished the stadium by, among other things, replacing the Jumbotron with a Dactronics video display, installing a new field turf artificial playing surface, conducting a complete makeover to open the 100 level concourse to the playing field and convert 43 luxury boxes to party suites. Over the next decade, the stadium continued to host the Toronto Blue Jays and the Toronto Argos, and a series of other events, like concerts and other sports. By 2020, with the stadium over 30 years old and one of the oldest active stadiums in MLB, Rogers had begun to explore options for the long-term home of the team. The Toronto Argonauts, which had called the Dome home since its opening, eventually left in 2016 for the BMO field. Rogers and Brookfield Asset Management reportedly discussed replacing Rogers Center with a smaller, baseball-specific stadium plus residential towers, office buildings, retail stores, and public space. The new venue would be constructed on the southern end of the current stadium and adjacent parking lots, 
while the mixed use development would be built on the northern portion of the site. However, the Blue Jays instead decided to undertake a major $400 million renovation of the stadium's interior in two phases during the 22 and 23 and the 23 and 24 off seasons. The objective of the renovations was to extend the ballpark's shelf life by another 10 to 15 years while continuing to plan for a new stadium or more significant rebuild of the Rogers Center within the next 10 to 12 years. The first phase of the renovations involved reorienting outfield seats to face home plate, raising bullpens, adjusting the outfield dimensions to be asymmetrical, adding social spaces with bars in the outfield section of the 500 level, and removing some seats to widen all remaining seats, thereby reducing capacity to 41,500 attendees. The second phase involved reorienting the infield seats to face the home plate the addition of cup holders to the seats in the 100 level, as well as reducing the size of foul territory, improving the dugouts for the Blue Jays and their opponents. LED panels were installed to cover the entire backstop for advertising, which is much more visible during television broadcasts. Following the second phase, capacity of the stadium was reduced further to 39,150 attendees. Today, the Sky Dome, yes, still the Sky Dome to most, stands as one of the last great symbols of the 1980s optimism. It was the first fully retractable roof stadium in the world. It redefined sports architecture. It turned Toronto into an international player. But beyond the steel, beyond the roof panels and luxury boxes, it changed how a city saw itself. Toronto had long been called a city that works. Safe, orderly, polite. But the dome showed it could also dream. It dared to build a machine that defied weather, logic and gravity, and was the first in the world to do so. The roof still moves, slowly and perfectly synchronized, like a heartbeat of engineering. And every time it opens, revealing the Toronto skyline and the CN Tower standing guard beside it, it reminds us of something simple. Once upon a time, the city built the future, and it called it Sky Dome. If you like this type of content and would like to learn more about the environment that surrounds us, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to this channel. Stay tuned for more!